Hey, welcome to the second season of Radiant Whispers. And we start with a fascinating topic, the power of myths. We all need myths. Myths are foundational stories that give us life, and without them, we die. Human beings need myths because we are stories made of stories. Poems decanted from poems, beings created and nurtured by stories and poems. History is a story. Without myths, we do not understand ourselves, nor do we have an ideal to which we can aspire. Trust me, myths are more solid than historical facts, because myths dig deeper. They are trees whose roots reached the deepest strata of our personal and planetary history. Myths tell us foundational stories, like Prometheus stealing the fire from the Olympian gods and giving it to humans so that one day humans could defeat them. Theseus entering the labyrinth of Gnosis to slay the Minotaur and emerging from that labyrinth with the help of Ariadna's thread. Jason confronting Medusa and the dragon to seize the golden fleece and recover the throne that legitimately belongs to him. Gilgamesh, or Noah, surviving the universal flood. The knights of the round table going out to the four corners of the earth in search of the Holy Grail that would restore King Arthur, and with that, the kingdom of Camelot. Myths are the oldest memories we have as a species, as a group. Laughing at myths is like laughing at our memories. Myths are not personal memories. They are memories of events that occurred on the same plane as the collective unconscious of humanity. When myths repeat almost identically in so many disconnected cultures, for example, the myth of the universal flood, they refer to historical events which not only happened to us at some point in time, but which later formed us as civilizations. Myths are not legends, much less fantasies. They are a living engine of history, giving us values and examples of virtue and conduct to follow. The heroes of myths are the characters we must embody in a play in which we are actors without realizing it. Like ideas, like art, like morals, there are good and bad myths. A good myth can create us. Did you know that the Aztecs invented the myth of the foundation of their city, Tenochtitlan, their capital, today's Mexico City? Their priests created the story that they founded Tenochtitlan when they came across a sign that their god, Huitzilopochtli, had given them years before to settle where they found an eagle devouring a snake. That story had so much substance and found such enormous resonance among the Aztecs that it transformed them. They began as a people with no home and no history. They staggered, hungry and cold for 700 kilometers from the mythical Aztlán to today's Mexico City and spent years starving in volcanic landscapes plagued by vipers until the lords of Texcoco and Tacuba, the region's great powers at the time, allowed them to settle in the mud flats and swamps of Lake Texcoco. The Aztecs invented for themselves a story so good, so inspiring, that it led them to become the greatest empire of Mesoamerica and the confines of their known world. I say that myths can be created deliberately not to discredit myths, but quite the opposite, to open our eyes to the power of myths and to the fact that we can create them. Let's talk about Islam, shall we? Islam is the second most widespread religion in the world. As with the Aztecs, Islam's past is based on myths and documents created hundreds of years after the death of Muhammad. Moreover, it is becoming more apparent every day that Mohammed, like Zarathustra or Hermes Trismegistus, has all the appearance of being a created myth as well. We will devote a whole episode to this fascinating subject soon. But for now, aware that myths can be created and propel an entire civilization to conquer the known world, 
Let's reread the mythology and sacred texts of all mankind with these eyes, with this optic, and see how alive they are. We just need to pick the myths and texts more suitable to enhancing our lives and our communities and decide which ones are not so suitable for that purpose. Mohammed, Zarathustra, Hermes Trismegistus are mythical heroes for millions and millions of good people. The magnificent deeds and characters and myths are much bigger than our own little personal dramas, and that is why it is so worth listening to them. Because there are periods in life when we will all be Noah or Gilgamesh, tossed back and forth by the flood around us, barely managing to stay afloat. What a consolation, then, that we do not have to sail alone and without a compass. Without the stories that myths have kept alive for us, we would have capsized. The Aztecs would never have become the most glorious empire in Mesoamerica. The Muslims would not have succeeded in burying Islam into the very veins of Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. Often our biggest problem is that science has become the new goddess, the new inquisition, the new gestapo, and finds it in very poor taste that silly people like Gabriel Porras go around talking about myths. What a contradiction this is, because science also has her own myths and her own saints and martyrs, her mystics, her savonarolas and heretics burned in the modern bonfire of public disgrace. Death by Twitter. Without a great myth to drive it, to give it meaning and value, science is nothing but knowledge without wisdom, a face without eyes, a smile without teeth. Without a great story to root it and drive it, science is just the sorcerer's apprentice. Remember Mickey Mouse manipulating forces he did not understand or know how to control when he wanted to make his job easy by magic. Such is knowledge without wisdom. As Joseph Campbell, the great master of mythology applied to everyday life, says, ancient mythology is the song of the universe, the music of the spheres, the music to whose beat we dance even though we cannot name the tune, something far beyond our small daily existence. And that is why it invites us to look far beyond, to aspire to much more than our small daily existence. Our ancestors invented stories about the animals they hunted for food and of the supernatural world to which those animals descended when they died. Early human societies learned the harsh reality that life only survives by feeding on other life, just as they had to hunt and eat animals to survive. This was the fundamental mystery that myths had to explain to them. The only way that the blood and violence of the hunt was not just a cruel and foolish slaughter, violence without rhyme or reason, was to elevate it to a ritual sacrifice. To compensate for the violence done to the animals, the hunters descended into deep and frightful caves, literally the underworld beyond the power of the sun to pay homage to the immortal spirit of the animals, to make a contract with them so they would return to the surface to be sacrificed again. The animals were not soulless and meaningless objects. They were sent from that supernatural world for the sustenance of human beings. This was the magical agreement between the hunters and their prey, linked in an eternal cycle of death, burial, and resurrection. This is the story illustrated beautifully in the caves of Altamira, Lascaux, and so many other places around the world. It is always more beautiful and motivating to explain the world with a story, with a myth. Have you read the excellent Life of Pi by the Canadian Jan Martel? Have you at least seen the movie? It is the story of a teenager who must travel in a boat with a hungry tiger and keep the tiger at bay for weeks wandering the sea until he finally is rescued. It is then that Pi, the castaway who survived such an ordeal, tells the dazzling story that makes up the book. 
But in the end, the insurance company forces him to tell another story because they refuse to believe such a poetic account of what happened. Pai has to set aside the splendid tale he has just told us, which was the only thing that kept him going, kept him alive, to describe the sordid violence and loss as it happened in real life. His story is like a flower that he is forced to strip of all its color and perfume. This is a trap that atheism sets for us by seeing everything in the plainest and most pedestrian way, erasing the poetry, the color, the perfume of the flower, or cataloging the height and width and density of a tree without grasping that there is a forest that gives the tree its identity, because the forest points to God, and that is extremely dangerous for atheism. Atheism behaves like an academic who likes to break down a poem and describe it in terms of rhyme, patterns, and syllables, and then tells us very proudly, this is a sonnet, this is a haiku, oh, and that one there is a villanelle. Mm, Yeah, thank you, but where is the poetry, the perfume of the poem in this analysis? Poetry like life is not the description, the listing of its characteristics. It is the intangible music embodied in those characteristics, something inapprehensible, something infinitely more interesting than those characteristics, a whole that is unimaginably better than the mere description of its parts, just like each one of us, because each one of us is a poem made of many poems, and we need poems to push us to stay alive. Oh, but you live in the clouds, Gabriel Porras. <laughs> yeah, I moved to the clouds, because here you can breathe clean air. When primitive societies discovered agriculture, they stopped being nomads chasing their prey and became sedentary farmers cultivating seeds. The seed became the new symbol of the eternal cycle of life. The plant dies, but its seed is buried and resurrected. Do you know that this is what baptism represents? This new symbol, the seed, appears in religions as the revelation of an eternal truth that out of death comes life, that death is only a short passage before life reappears, even more glorious and triumphant. No one said it better than Jesus Christ. Unless the seed falls to the ground and dies, it accomplishes nothing. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Who are the characters and myths? The heroes. And why do we need to hear the stories of these heroes? Because, as Joseph Campbell says, again, by triumphing over his darkest passions, the hero symbolizes our ability to control the irrational savage within us. That's why we all need heroes and heroines to look up to and emulate in our humble daily lives. And one of the next episodes of this podcast will be dedicated to the figure and the journey of the hero. The hero is not the one who completes a heroic act and nothing else. The striker who scores the winning goal on Sunday, and that's it. No, the hero undertakes a brave and eventful journey of self-discovery. When threatened by the monster or dragon of the story, the hero must find or create in himself or herself the strength of character to fulfill his destiny. Frodo is not a hero because he finally threw the ring into the raging volcano of Mordor. He is a hero because he put his life on the line from the very first moment to reach the volcano in Mordor. Destroying the ring itself was just the mission that made him display his heroic metal from the first moment he had the ring in his possession. Frodo is a hero not because he finally destroyed the ring. He is a hero because against all perils and dangers, he covered the distance until he was able to destroy the ring. Victory is not just found at the end of the road. It is in every humble step we take every day 
to reach the end of the road. More than clarifying the meaning of life, myth and hero help us understand the daily experience of being alive. Stories from all cultures explain creation, birth, incarnation, death, resurrection, return, and final judgment. Atheism is forcibly imposed on us and our children in all schools because apparently its explanation of the universe and life is more rational, more scientific, more intelligent. I'm not sure that is the case at all. Atheism behaves like an oarsman, a rower, who throws the oars and the rudder overboard in the middle of the ocean because they seem to him to be antiquated artifacts to move among the waves. Mates aren't going to explain everything to you, thoroughly, rationally. That's why it is best to forget them. This is like saying that in order to see better, you must gouge out your eyes. <laughs> Gabriel, it's just that your eyes don't let you see beyond the horizon, okay? Therefore, they are deficient. Therefore, take them out. That is the proposal offered by atheism, a religion. Atheism is a religion that gets a respect it does not deserve because it is never earned by merit, but by law, by government decree, by sheer intimidation because the poor teacher who dares not to teach it in school as the only and sufficient explanation of the mystery of life and the cosmos loses his or her job and career. This coercion is the only thing that keeps atheism alive, and it is shameful. We will devote entire episodes to the atheist religion, which frankly, once you look at it closely, is the most irrational of all. Let us return to the power of myths and to the error of dismissing them as if they were mere fantasies and legends. I'll tell you a couple of striking examples of how real the best myths always are. Troy and Atlantis. For centuries, all we knew about Troy was what we read until today in Homer. The Iliad and the Odyssey describe events in the Trojan War back in the 12th century B.C. The Homeric poems are glorious. If you're going to read only five great books in your life, only five, read The Iliad and the Odyssey, and you're ready to up. The others are the Bible, the Divine Comedy, and I'd say John Milton's Paradise Lost, but I'll leave this fifth place open for you to suggest. Leave me a comment below with your fifth great book, or your five great books if they are better than mine. The Iliad recounts the war of the Achaeans against the Trojans after Prince Paris of Troy stole the beautiful Helen, daughter of Zeus and Leda, and wife of the king of Sparta, Menelaus. The conflict took 11 years to resolve. Many centuries have passed since because we're talking about the 12th century BC, the Iron Age. The region of Troy had been invaded and recaptured many times by dozens of armies over the centuries. Hence, no trace of ancient Troy was evident in plain sight, and educated and rational people said that all that Homer sings about so rapturously was just an old legend, a fantasy. Nice poem, but where is the evidence? Where have I heard that phrase a lot? Where is the evidence? Oh, <laughs> among my atheist friends. Nice fantasy that there is a god, but where is the evidence? Oh, the canning of self-induced blindness. Anyway, it was taken for granted in learned circles that everything Homer reported was pure fantasy, until the millionaire German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann took him at his word. Schliemann arrived in 1870, determined to excavate the site where ancient Troy had once been, and he had to dig eight meters deep, because there were nine cities built on top of each other, and Homer's Troy was perhaps the sixth or seventh of them. But Schliemann found a splendid treasure three years later. And having found Troy, the city attacked in the Iliad, he then went to look for more in Mycenae, the city of the leader of the attackers. 
and taking seriously what another ancient author, Pausanias, tells us, he found there the tomb of the legendary Agamemnon, the leader of the Achaeans who attacked Troy. All of this because Schliemann decided to take seriously what the ancient book said, which learned people in the universities consider myths and legends. It was all true. It all had a basis in history, in reality. Those priceless treasures reappeared to us, to the world, because someone heard the myth and took it seriously, even if all the university professors laughed at him. Besides, Heinrich Schliemann already deserved a note in world history. Any man who names his children after Andromache and Agamemnon is a very unusual man. Imagine you're in a big posh party, and the waiter at the entrance asks you, uh, What is your name, miss? Andromache Schliemann. And the gentleman? Agamemnon Schliemann. Wonderful. Come in, come in. Thank you. Thanks to Schliemann, today there is a discipline called geomythology, precisely to find the actual geological events that so many myths describe. And speaking of geomythology, my second example is something even more exciting, I think, because it is happening in our days before our astonished eyes. For centuries we heard about Atlantis, the legendary continent that disappeared without leaving anything but the legend of its glory after it was swallowed by the waves one fateful day. Everything we knew for more than 2,000 years was told to us by the beautiful Plato. Solon, one of the founding fathers of Athens, heard about the magnificent city of Atlantis from the priests of a temple in Egypt, which Solon visited around the year 600 B.C., around the time the Buddha was born, by the way. Intrigued, Solon asked the priests when the waves had swallowed the mythical Atlantis, and the priests answered without hesitation, 9,000 years ago. Now, if we take this figure seriously and add those 9,000 years to the 600 BC when Solon received this answer, we're talking about the year 9,600 BC. And since you and I are talking in around 2000 AD, we must add another 2,000 years to the 9,600. That is, we come to a grand total of 11,600 years ago. Well, it turns out that 11,600 years ago, a cataclysm of apocalyptic proportions occurred, affecting the entire globe. Many cities and whole islands, among them, indeed, Atlantis, disappeared on that date. And what's amazing is that we only learned this 15 years ago, in the year 2007. But it is a fact so explosive in its implications that it shakes and rewrites our old notions of the origins of history. If you want to find out more about this fascinating event, look up Gobekli Tepe on YouTube. Govekli Tepe. I'll leave the link in the notes. Let Klaus Schmidt, another German archaeologist like Schliemann, explain to you his remarkable discoveries in this incredibly advanced city in Upper Mesopotamia, buried 11,600 years ago. Govekli Tepe is the oldest sanctuary in the planet debunking the Muslim claim for Mecca. Gobekli Tepe is a monolithic city more impressive and complex than Stonehenge, and it is 7,000 years older than Stonehenge. In other words, the myth of Atlantis that Plato told us about was not a far-fetched fantasy. There is solid geological and historical data at the root of the myth. Bravo! A great myth is a foundational story that explains the world at the deepest root level to understand our origin and destiny. 
If we do not understand origin and destiny, we're just flailing in the void. A great myth is that story that allows us to understand origin and destiny and includes us individually, makes you and me participants as unique and unrepeatable individuals that you and I are, of the past, present, and future. All of history, from way down there where it began, to way up there where it will end. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, here I jump headlong into the arena. The greatest and most luminous myth, the most worthy of credit and solid foundational story that humanity has ever had at hand, is Christianity, nurtured by her magnificent Greek, Roman, and Jewish roots. And where is the evidence? The evidence is a free where? No other foundational story could even begin to support the science, technology, discovery, research, and sustained impetus that has helped Western civilization create the fairest, most democratic, most desirable societies of all time. Ask yourself, if Islam is half as wonderful as they say, why do hundreds of thousands of Muslim refugees risk their lives to cross the Mediterranean to find refuge in Europe? No other culture has produced better education and technology, given more respect and status to women, children, foreigners, the disabled, even animals. More respect and status to religious, sexual and political minorities of all shapes and colors, Better transport and communications, better schools, hospitals, orphanages, universities, music, literature, cinema, museums, press, sports, even television. And I better stop now, because we may stay here all day long. And that is not an empty brag. It's the evidence that Christianity, nurtured by her magnificent Greek, Roman, and Jewish roots, is the best founding story for a civilization. The evidence is everywhere, and it speaks loudly to anyone who is intellectually honest and awake. We live in a critical moment. We need the intuitions of yesteryear to help us stay alive. If human beings like you and me are meaningless, as Richard Dawkins claims from Oxford, why would we care about what happens to the whales? The oceans, the polar caps. If the whales, the oceans, the polar caps, and you and I are a simple accident of totally blind and impersonal forces, as atheism claims we are, why do we bother defending them? Why keep fighting? Why endure the suffering and rigors of this life? If there is no meaning to be found in them, in us, if we, you and I, have no meaning, Atheism fails as a founding story. Joseph Campbell says that we are participating in the greatest leap of the human spirit toward knowledge, not only of outer nature, but also of our deep inner mystery. All the movies we see today owe their life to these myths and heroes, so universal that they speak to us all beyond our culture and condition. They teach us that the greatest adventure of the soul is to recover God, to recover and rediscover itself in God. Myths are keys to our unfathomable spiritual potential and can lead us to enlightenment and ecstasy. To me, the only story with that richness and depth is Christianity. Do you know a better one? Leave me a comment. As Joseph Campbell says, myths tell me where I am. I bid you farewell and ask you as a friend, what myth is inspiring your days? What foundational story weaves together and gives meaning to your actions, your triumphs and failures, your bright days and your dark days? Don't go through life without a great story that shapes you, 
that gives you a luminous origin and a destiny full of glory that makes you a member of a royal lineage and gives you an heroic mission. Thank you for listening. My name is Gabriel Porras, and I'm a professional voice artist. Find me in gabrielvoice.com and at radiantwhispers.com. Let's do great mythical deeds together. <laughs>